Welcome to another episode of Relationship Alive. This is your host, Neil Satin. If you've listened to some of the other episodes, then by now you've heard how so much of what happens to us as kids can affect how we are in relationship as adults. You can get into the specifics if you want, and there are times when I think that's a good idea, but you can also look at the big picture of whether or not you had a secure attachment with your parents and now are able to have a healthy, secure style in your adult relationships, or you might find that you developed what's known as an insecure attachment style with your parents, and now that is affecting how you connect with or withdraw from the people you love as an adult. So, do you sometimes feel an overarching need for space and find yourself always feeling like your partner wants too much from you? Or do you start to feel anxious when you're alone, like your partner isn't there for you enough? Well, guess what? This all relates to your attachment style. And the great thing about it is, there's something you can do. On today's show, we're going to talk all about what that is. Our guest is Stan Tatkin, doctor of psychology, one of the world's experts on attachment theory, and the author of Wired for Love, How Understanding Your Partner's Brain and Attachment Style can help you diffuse conflict and build a secure relationship. On this show, we're going to get to know the ins and outs of how we attach to others and give you some successful strategies for knowing and understanding yourself and your partner and finding healthy ways to support each other in relationship. If you're single, we're also going to talk about the implications of attachment style on dating. And Stan's new book, Wired for Dating, is coming out this month, January of 2016. If you download the show guide for this episode, found at neilsatin.com slash wired, or text the word PASSION to the number 33444 and follow the instructions, that will qualify you to win a signed copy of Stan's book, Wired for Love. There's a lot of ground to cover, so let's get started. Stan Tatkin, thank you so much for joining us here on Relationship Alive. Thank you, Neil. It's really good to be here. Excellent. Let's jump right in and talk about Wired for Love and attachment styles. And perhaps you could give us just a brief overview of what you mean by your style of attachment, secure versus insecure, and and how that could be having an impact on someone's relationship. Well, let's go back to childhood. This refers to infant studies going back to the 50s, where we found out that the human animal, just like the primate, um, really is driven by the need to connect physically for warmth, comfort, for safety, security, with at least one other same species animal, in this case for us, our mothers. And that relationship is secure if the in this case the the older person the parent the caregiver is has enough resources to find the baby you know in this case you know find the baby in terms of psychologically uh the baby's eyes the baby's attention through face to face skin to skin eye to eye contact and lose the baby find the baby lose the baby so you know in secure relationships there's a lot of presence and attention and uh, a lot of contact and interaction with a parent that is curious, interested, and well-resourced, okay? So that's kind of how everything begins on the right foot. And then it continues through different stages of development where the caregiver continues to have to find the baby, so to speak. So it's a process of finding and losing, finding and losing, you know, making errors in error correction or injury and repair. Mm -hmm. Um, And so those of us who come from that relationship where relationships are the central important thing in the, in the culture, relationships are coming first, are more resilient, less prone to uh, having to spend a lot of resources in life to suffer the vicissitudes of, of life. And, um, and then there's everything other than that, right? So when you get into less secure attachment, this is a perceptual thing for the infant, child, adult. Then you get into a different culture that is more shaped in um, in unfairness, uh, too much of the time, um, uh, you know, uh, injustice too much of the time, and insensitivity too much of the time, and so something other than relationship comes first in people who are more distancing. 
that you know they're distancing they come from a culture where uh, where the uh, the sense of performance and appearance that is overarching uh, one's self self esteem that's really overarching and that and people from that culture tend to go forward and distance because they're afraid when they get into a dependency relationship that they're going to be co-opted used as they were as, as children right they're just going to be there as a tool uh, to perform to look good or whatever mm-hmm. and so these people are afraid of losing their stuff they're afraid of losing the self people on the other side of insecurity where they cling um, came from a culture where they had to care for at least one parent's emotional state and they were rewarded for being dependent. Now, so these people um, have a hard time because their parent at once is there and very present and then not, uh, is preoccupied. And that makes for an angry kid or a kid who um, feels that as soon as I get close to you, the other shoe is going to drop. And so these people go through life um, expecting to be abandoned. And so very sensitive to withdrawal. And when they get close to somebody, they start to push away because they believe the, uh, that, that that can't sustain and there's going to be a bad thing that's going to happen next. So we call those people waves and we call people on the distancing group islands. And this, this is a normal pattern. It's not pathology. It's simply an adaptation to one's environment. That's why I kind of think of it as a culture. You know, it's a, you know, the island is a culture of, uh, I do everything myself. Nobody can do it better than me. I don't like dependency. I'm not needy. I don't like neediness. Um, I don't depend on anybody. I keep things to myself. It's that kind of culture. Whereas the other one is you know, I, I, I have to interact with people. I have to talk. Um, I don't like anyone to leave. I don't, I'm very sensitive to separations and reunions. Um, I'm very chatty, uh, very related. But I don't shift very well from being with somebody to being alone. So when we see these people, we not only see an attachment style, uh, basically an idea of how dependency works and doesn't work, but also there's a, a biological aspect to this that has to do with how the nervous system operates in these different camps. Mm-hmm. And again, if people understand this is, not, uh, this is not a bad thing or a good thing, it just is. It's nature, like trees that are bent a certain way because of the sun. These are orientations based on experience. Right. Does that and make sense? It does. And you talk in your book about our warring brain versus our loving brain. Yes. And- and I'm, I'm really intrigued by how even the warring brain can hijack the loving brain. And, and that's part of where those other styles of right. island versus wave come into play, right? Well, that's part of it. That's, that's, so here we're talking about um, the brain's negativity bias. Mm. This is a known uh, this this is a known fun, uh, uh, aspect of the brain. So the brain is basically... There are more parts that experience pain and negativity than positivity. So the reason for that is for survival of the species. But if I were left alone, if I didn't have anybody to interact with, I would be more fearful, more, uh, more negative, more aggressive, maybe even a little crazier than the average person because being left alone with one's own mind for too long without interaction is not a good thing. Mm. So um, so. It makes sense that we're going to remember painful things better, faster, easier than positive things because we have to remember where not to go so we don't get killed. That's why I say it's easier to go to war than uh, stay in love with everybody uh, because we have memories. So when you talk about the wave as a wave or as somebody who was uh, uh, you know, very dependent in my childhood – my fears are real because they're based in real experience. I remember that. And so you can't really talk me out of that. If I'm somebody who is afraid of being engulfed and co-opted and taken over and losing myself and being trapped, you can't really talk me out of that because I, I remember that from childhood. That was a mm-hmm. real memory. So we're dealing with people coming to the table already 
um, in their bodies, afraid of what they believe will happen. And oddly enough, this only comes up once they start to feel committed to each other. It's not there so much in courtship. So people can people can be fooled if they're not paying attention, um, uh, you know, because these fears that come from memory are only really engaged when we begin, you and I begin to see each other as permanent. And now the fun begins. And now we, be, now we become deep family. Um, and people are surprised by this. And uh, I'm tr- we're trying to uh, show people not to be surprised by this, that this is, this is what people do. Uh, there's a lot of things that people do that, uh, that we still tend to get stunned about, but yet it's, the, what, uh, <laughs> it's how we roll. Uh, uh, so, is it is it normal for someone to be, say, mostly a wave um, when they're and, and I think we're talking about like some people when they're at their best maybe tend to just feel like oh I'm an anchor when I'm at my best of course and then but it's when you get triggered in one direction that you're gonna you're gonna head toward wave or toward island but is it is it possible for someone to actually be able to go in either direction um, depending on the circumstances if somebody is secure um, enough that is they are an anchor but they're wavish or they're, they can be islandish they're more likely to be fluid in a partnership where one person becomes more distancing the other person becomes more clinging and they'll find themselves shifting and changing um, and it is possible that somebody who's more secure can be pulled in one direction or the other if that person is sort of the dominant, you know, the alpha in the relationship. Uh, that can happen. But mostly we're ishy, right? Um, I can be wave-ish. I can be islandish. There are, in fact, people who are dyed in the world, card-carrying, you know, islands. And they've been this way since childhood. And there's been no correction throughout life. And they're still this way. Um, or a wave. And, and that does exist. But those people are not a problem either. <laughs> um, as long as they understand who they are, and they understand their reflexes, and, they're, and, and very importantly, their partner knows who that person is and how they work and how to handle them. They have their owner's manual. Yeah. That's the important thing. It's not whether you are this or that, and that people shouldn't get too uh, wrapped up in that. This is simply about how someone is going to act when they start to depend on somebody, and, and all of this is quite predictable. So you work with animals, and you know that certain breeds and certain kinds of animals are you know, inclined to do this or perceive this or to move in this way. The same thing with people. Um, we're all very different and yet uh, similar, and a lot of our similarities and a lot of the ways that we're rigid, the good news is that the more rigid we are, the more predictable we are. So that is very consistent with what we promote with couples in terms of secu- being in, in a secure functioning relationship. Yeah, when on this show, we've actually talked quite a bit about how about the importance of having a safe container for your relationship. And we've attacked that from a number. I, I think that's kind of ironic that I just used the word attacked, but we've yeah, talked yeah. about that from several different angles. And then, you know, as I was reading Wired for Love, I realized that, well, this is basically a manual for how to feel safe in relationship. Yes. And from there, it's like you have this foundation of safety and then anything is possible, right? Right. If we don't feel safe and secure in a relationship, our primary relationship, um, we act strange. We start to have trouble with concentration, with focus, with creativity, with patience. Um, we are not as nice. Um, it's a strain uh, on our mind and body, brain and body. Um, and we, you know, uh, uh, the stress encountered in relationships that are insecure uh, is enough to really make somebody sick in the long run. Uh, it causes a lot of wear and tear on the body and the brain. So that's why this emphasis on safety and security between two human beings is uh, is central. Can you talk for a moment about the the sort of paradoxical nature of an island and attachment? Um, with the wave, it, I think it makes more obvious sense. Like here's a person who really needs relatedness in order to feel secure. 
And yet you have an island and it, it sounds like on the one hand, we're talking about, well, they need relatedness too, but on the other hand, they feel safest when they are distancing. So how do those line up? They both want and need relationship and they both deserve it. Their fears about what will happen uh, is what causes uh, a threat in the system. So even if I'm the most island person, I still want to be with you. I still need a relationship. I still don't like being alone. I just don't want to feel trapped. And so um, when, I, when I, you know, I can pursue you, Neil, as somebody that I want to be with, and then once you're there, then I have to deal with another reality that I'm not aware of when I'm chasing you. And that is, once you're there, I begin to feel all the things and remember all the things that were dangerous to me as a child, such as not being able to have my independence. Mm. And I start to see you as, as someone who is taking that from me, even though that's not true. Um, and so I'm likely to do things that look and seem like I'm not interested in you. It's not that. It's that how do I get the neck? How do I get the nectar without getting the poison? And uh, that's the trickery. That's the difficulty for people who are very insecure to deal with. How do I get what's good about this without the bad? And my attempts to navigate that causes trouble in the relationship. Maybe threatens you. Maybe it sounds like I'm being unfair too much or in unjust too much, or insensitive too much. Insecures, by definition, uh, are not uh, are pro-self and not pro-relationship when it comes down to it. When it comes down to it, they're one-person systems, psychological systems, because they grew up in that culture. And it goes like this. It has to be good for me, and it should be good for you, but if it isn't, I'm sorry. A secure relationship is one that's truly mutual and collaborative. It's always win-win. If it's, if it's good for me, it must be good for you or we, do, or we don't do it. So we only move along together in this way that is truly mutual, collaborative, fair, just, and sensitive. That's what secures do or secure functioning people do. So you can understand that if we're insecure, the things we do to protect ourselves are going to be insensitive. <laughs> The very thing that we experienced in our childhood, um, uh, it'll be unfair, right? And so on a social justice level, it can't work, right? Yeah, I'm, I'm thinking about how you keep mentioning culture. And I think in general, our culture here in the States, and maybe it's even safe to say Western culture, yes. really <clears throat> values independence. Yes, and so I could see someone being an island and thinking like, this is how you're supposed to be. And that idea of prioritizing the relationship above my needs, that sounds like codependence to me. So well, how, could you, yeah. how could you draw a distinction between securely attached and putting the relationship first versus a dance of codependency? Great. Let me let me say two things to that. One is that you know our heritage, yes, is from uh, the UK, right? Separating from uh, kind of colonies and separating from the king, but we're also French <laughs> because our idea of freedom is based on on French's uh, on the French people's idea of freedom, French Revolution, so on. So we we this idea that we carry of liberty and and freedom uh, uh, is is gone a little too far in the Western culture because there's much more isolation now than ever before in many ways. So here we're trying to go back to an idea of interdependency, uh, not dependency, and, uh, and not a monarchy in relationships, uh, but a, a, a real collaborative two-person system. And there's, there's a basis for this biologically in that that mammals pair bond. One of the reasons we pair bond is not just to have offspring that we protect for a minimum of four years, but it's also to protect the, the dyad from a, a dangerous environment, from predators. Um, we're in the foxhole together. We, we're, we're primarily there to make sure, to ensure each other's safety, um, existence, but in human terms, it's not just surviving, but thriving as well. So, um, 
uh, your other question was uh, was about. Uh, remind me again because I went off the rails here. What was what was the central question you just asked? I had yeah. to say that I think about our kind of freedom that we think of. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it was that like how does ah, I remember putting the relationship first yeah. contrast with codependency, like sacrificing yourself for the sake yeah. of the relationship. So I was I was around during the age when this was coined. I was with Bradshaw in the beginning, uh, you know, around the time of uh, John Bradshaw, P. Melody, and others. And so I'm very familiar with this term. Um, codependency comes out of the A tradition. It was originally co-alcoholic. The the alcoholic is preoccupied with his or her alcohol. The codependent is preoccupied with uh, with the alcoholic, right? Mm-hmm. And so. Uh, so this is in attachment terms and in and in uh, in regulation theory terms, the wave, who goes in one direction only. This is part of the uh, the regulatory strategy, the self care strategy of waves, is what we call external regulation. It goes in one direction only. So I focus over focus on you, but not myself. Or I want you to over focus on me, but I don't pay attention to you. It's a one direction only um, process of, of, of interacting that is um, that that lacks simultaneity. That's the codependent, by the way. Um, a secure functioning relationship is the opposite of that because these two people are are um, operating according to mutually agreed upon principles that serve a third thing called the relationship that they created, not each other. They put the relationship first. Therefore, in terms of how you say this, this is what we do as, as, a, as a twosome. This is what we don't do. We tell each other everything. Why? Because why not? Um, we have each other's backs in public and private. We, uh, we know each other better than we know ourselves. We're experts on each other. Um, we are the go-to people because we're tethered together. We get our source of, 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 of safety, security, but also confidence from that partner. From other people as well, but that central partner, we are the roof of the house, the top of the food chain, king and queen. We are the bosses. We're the leaders of the community. That couple represents a mini society with its own social justice rules. It affects the children. It affects the community. So we're talking about two people holding each other's feet to the fire and expecting um, to provide for one another. I'm in your care. You're in my care. We are both pain in the asses. We're both burdens. I take you as my burden. You take me as your burden. That's the quid pro quo. Now, that is a realistic adult way of viewing pair bonding. Right, we are here together to do a certain job that allows us to uh, to survive and thrive. Nobody else wants to do these things but us. Nobody else cares. Therefore, we do it because we can. Do you follow what I'm saying? Yeah, absolutely. And we see people doing this. Just in case people think this is a unicorn, we see homeless people doing this. We see mentally um, ill people um, are able to uh, form secure functioning relationships. I see it all the time. We have people in the in the police department, in the uh, Navy SEALs, and all f- uh, forms of you know stratos- uh, uh, you know s- the social emotional stratosphere of different so- uh, social uh, uh, economic uh, uh, people you know areas people functioning. We see it everywhere, and so if they can do it, everybody can do it. But you have to kind of understand that. There's a reason to be together, to pair bond, and it goes beyond love. It goes beyond having similarities or things in common. It goes to a very practical uh, situation where, uh, you know, you're in the foxhole together. Uh, and that, that carries out to everything. Okay? Yeah, and it sounds like from your perspective, there's a profound difference in what one is capable of experiencing in their lives if they are securely attached and have that as a springboard to how they interact with life yeah. versus someone who's just amazingly self-confident and completely independent. I mean, right. I think independence is, is an illusion, obviously. Well, maybe it's not obvious for some people, but um, would you say that the... Um, well, I'm curious, is that true that that it's that you... 
see securely attached people as having that edge over how they actually experience life? Well, I want to separate out securely attached as what we're talking about in childhood and the notion that even two insecure individuals can form a secure functioning bond, secure, secure functioning relationship, because that's one of agreements based on principles that are good for me and good for you. Mm. These are truly mutual systems that are fully collaborative. And it's available to anybody, but they have to, they have to understand the reason for this and why this is important and better than the alternative. And a lot of that um, is a, a, a challenge for our educational systems, for our, cult, for our particular, particular culture, because we don't have strong messages about the purpose of coupling. Um, we have things out there such as your soulmate and religious reasons and whatever. Uh, but we, what we see in our uh, findings is that the people who hold together are the people who understand um, the realities of the world. They accept losses. They, uh, they accept good enough and not perfect. Um, and they're able to work collaboratively uh, and see this for what it is. Um, you and I do these things for each other because the alternative isn't good. Uh, that we're alone. So uh, can people be fully independent? No, there's no such thing. I mean, there are outliers out there, some people who are not the same as the majority and they're wired a little bit different. Uh, but those are rare, very, very rare. Most of us, all of us are wired to need uh, to interact. Otherwise, we go, we go mad. We go crazy. So that seemed like a really important distinction that you were making that it's not important for someone to recognize they're an island in a wave and then to focus their energy on becoming anchors in order to have great relationship. It's more like you understand who you are, where you're coming from, and where your partner's coming from, and then yes. you create agreements that help you support each other. Yes, and I also have to know exactly how you work and not complain about it. Um, uh, you know, when people came to you um, for, you know, to help with training of animals, I, I would imagine that, be, that not being able to handle their animal in the way that they wanted to made them not like the animal. Is, was that, did you find that to be true? Well, yeah, I mean, I suppose looking at it in terms of islands and waves, it either made them not not like their animal or feel like a weird distance, like an island, or it made them profoundly distressed, like they weren't able to connect with their animal the way that they wanted to. Right. So take that and, and apply it to almost everything with humans. Um, we don't, if our baby is uh, colicky and has GERD and is crying, we can't settle the baby. Um, if I'm mom or dad, I may begin to distance or begin to not like the baby because I feel like I feel incompetent. I can't calm down uh, and my baby can't calm down. Or if we have a dog that doesn't lick, I want a dog that licks. I don't like this dog. Or a computer we can't operate. Anything we can't handle or manage, we tend to not like. So that's the same thing in our love relationships. If I know who you are and I know how to manage you in the, in the good way, I feel confident and competent. I'm able to do things that nobody else can do with you. I'm valuable. And this is also a feeling of being close. So this is in both directions. Both people have to uh, understand that they're in each other's care, not simply their own care. It's a different way of thinking. And... So when they're in each other's care, I'd like to get into some of the specific strategies that you offer of sure. how people can really get to know each other. Because I think some of your ex the exercises in the book, Wired for Love, are really powerful as a way of encouraging you to be really a detective with your partner. And, yes. and I'm curious as to why you chose that approach versus just asking your partner, what can I do for you? Why did and and maybe we could talk about? I'm trying to remember the specific name of one sure. of your exercises, but um, talk about why did you take that approach of encouraging people to be detectives and try things out and and try to evoke states in their partner? Maybe it was the emote me exercise. That it might have the emote me exercise uh, because I I um, you know if 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 I had a baby, 
I would not expect the baby to tell me what he or she wanted. <laughs> I would have to find the baby. I would have to learn the baby. I would have to allow the baby to come into being by being curious and, uh, and, uh, and to be searching and, like I said before, losing and finding, losing and finding. That's the same thing in a relationship. I'm supposed to learn you. Um, you're not supposed to give me instructions. Um, uh, when I buy you something, it's better for me that if I notice what you want than to keep asking you what do you want. It, it shows a, that I don't pay attention, that I don't really watch and listen and learn you. So here, if, if we're in each other's care, I'm supposed to be able, if you don't talk as much as I do, and I want you to talk, that's no excuse. I should be able to see and, and read you um, uh, when you don't talk. Can I read you? Can I see you? Can I understand you? That is our job. And so it, it, it goes away from what do I need? It goes away from how am I feeling right now? If you and I are interactively regulating at a close distance, um, the way our brain works is you can see what's going on inside of me before I know it, and I can see what's going on in you before you know it. Therefore, nature has seemed to build in a certain process that's close face-to-face, eye-to-eye, that allows us to mutually regulate each other. I make adjustments depending on what I see. I error correct. I repair. You do that too, and this allows us to be in each other's eyes and to be together for a very long time. But if I'm focused on myself and you're focused on yourself, um, that begins to uh, cause a disruption in the interaction. We start to get it that we're on our own, and we start to feel threatened. In love relationships, that does not work. It works better that I, at- I pay attention to your state because where you go, I go, and you pay attention to my state because where I go, you go. Um, this is a psychobiological reality. And so uh, um, th- that's why I say the orientation is, is a bit outward um, because you don't tell your kid, you know what, I, I need to... I just need time away. I'm getting overwhelmed. I, I, I'm ambivalent about being a parent, I, so I'm going to go away for a while. You don't, <laughs> you don't do that, right? Um, uh, and, it's so, uh, and so the same thing in a love relationship. You know, um, uh, when people say, and I hear all the time in the office, I've got to take care of myself. They don't understand that in love relationships, in an interdependent relationship, that is a threat, that's a threat. And uh, that means the other person better start taking care of themselves too. That's yeah. not how this relationship works. I think what's important about that is, in light of what I was reading in your work, is that you may not think it's a threat. You, like intellectually, you may say, that's great that my partner wants to take care of themselves. But it sounds like that primitive part of your brain right. is just going to register it as a threat. Absolutely, and that's what we're talking about here. Um, the primitive part of our brain rules, always. Um, it's cheap, it's fast, it's, it's all based in memory, um, it's, it's efficient. It's always going to trump the smarter thinking part of us, or part of our brain, which is energy consuming, slow, um, and is not going to be there if we're in distress because it requires a lot of oxygen and glucose to run put a lot of stress into your body or be afraid of your partner or intimidated and you cannot use that part of your brain anymore. So we have to focus on the animal that is us, um, that reacts to uh, the tilt of the head, the tone of the voice, um, the eyes gazing away, a dangerous word, a dangerous phrase. That's who we are. That's what we're dealing with. Can you talk for a moment about the balance between what kind of self-care is help, helpful and appropriate? And it's certainly in terms of of recognizing your own fears maybe in relationship and how you would address that for yourself versus make, you know, being aware in partnership and having your partner really respecting your fears and, and helping to not trigger them or to to come come to you to help when they have inadvertently triggered your fears. Well, this is where um, the understanding of why a couple is doing coupling comes in first. First, we have to have an overarching theory about this. So you and I, we agree that, um, that if either of us are in distress, we drop what we're doing, we take care of that distressed, 
that distress post haste, right? That becomes very important. Um, when I hurt your feelings, um, the very first thing I do is, is uh, relieve you. I provide relief. I, I, I lead with relief. Because anything I say or do that's different than that is going to increase your level of threat. And that's going to blow back on me. So we have agreements of how we're going to handle each other, what's important, what's not important. When we're in distress, if I say something to you and it really hurts me, uh, we agree that we take that seriously. We don't mock it. We don't devalue it. Um, and we repair as necessary. That's what we do, the two of us. So those agreements have to be there first, I think, in order to make this fully collaborative. And then when we, when we misstep and we violated that, our, our own principle here, all you have to do is invoke the, I thought, I thought this is what we do. I thought, this is, I thought we decided this is what we don't do. And if I really did believe in this principle, I should say, oh, you're right. I'm so sorry. Yeah, you're right. You know, I, and that keeps us in line. So um, we're, here we're talking about principles that protect both of us, good for me, good for you. And most people do, don't talk about this. They don't set this up. They, th they leave it to, to just being implicit um, and just unsaid. But it's, these are agreements between people, social contracts. You know, we tell each other everything. Why? Because I picked you. You picked me. We're in the foxhole together. Why wouldn't I want you to know me as well as I know myself? What would be the point of withholding that information? That's a lot of work. So it's, it, the, the reasoning for doing these things is a good thing, not because I'm, I'm reporting to mommy or daddy. Do you understand? So a, a lot of this is attitude at the top and understanding the purpose of this relationship, why we're doing these things, um, why we're enforcing certain principles that, that rein in our behavior when we're in bad moods or we don't like each other. Uh, because we believe in these things in terms of being able to get through life. Yeah, right. I'm thinking about, because I feel like this situation comes up pretty commonly in, well, I've experienced it myself, and then also with couples that I've worked with, where through some sheer stroke of irony, the thing that one or both partners loves to do the most when they're really in it and fully shining and radiating and let's say, attracting attention from other people, that can become really, it can feel really threatening to the other partner. Mm -hmm. And um, so what would be the balance there between, and, and how might a couple structure an agreement where it's like, yeah, I don't want to control you. It, you know, in, initially someone might hear this and say, well, actually, I don't want you to do that thing that you love because I find myself getting triggered and freaked out and if we were putting the relationship first, you wouldn't do that because it triggers me. And so where's the balance between that, which seems like it would actually really be depriving the other person of something that was really important to them and the, and the counter, um, the counterpoint to it, which is, um, that the people actually get to experience the feeling of trust and, oh, when I, I, I got through that experience and I didn't lose my partner, I didn't get, I didn't experience the bomb that I thought I was going to experience that's been triggering all that fear in me. Are you following my question? I am. And um, th there's a lot said there, so I need to break it down. Great. Um, and it's probably even better if you have a very, very specific um, example because we're dealing with a lot of complexity here and the devil's in the details because um, uh, this could be several different things, um, not just one thing. So do you, before I launch into my, my rant, <laughs> um, can, do you have a, a specific example of something? Yeah, I'll, um, I'll go for self-disclosure here. Okay. So, um, you just said a friend of mine. <laughs> that's true. Well, a friend of mine. Someone I know. I'll, I'll talk about me. Um, <laughs> so... Yeah, my so my partner Chloe and I are both dancers, and we oh, do we do conscious dance. So it's um it's a very uplifting spiritual kind of dance that we do every single Sunday morning, almost without fail. And um and we both love to dance. We dance with each other. We dance with other people. Um and and this is so this in particular something that's really evolved for us as a couple. In fact, we met dancing and uh -huh. the way that we experience each other in the dance has evolved over this time. 
However, that being said, um, there was a time when I felt really, really triggered when she would dance with other guys. Yeah. Even though I knew that she was with me. Yes. But I would see her and I would see, you know, the, and the way that we dance, sometimes it's like really close and your, your body is in contact with another body. And um, so, so anyway, that at that time was really triggering for me. Um, it would have been easy for me to say, just don't do that. Like, can't you just dance with other women? Cause I like that, you know, <laughs> versus yes, you dancing right. with other guys. Yeah. Um, and, and instead, you know, we went through a long process of, of working with that, working with our, with our fears. Um, anyway, so that's this specific example. And, gotcha. you know, it could have been easy for me to just draw a line and say, yeah, if you, if you really respect me in this environment and the, how unhappy it makes me when that happens, you just wouldn't do that. Right. Um, versus what we ended up doing, which, which, um, gives us each permission to dance with, with people that, are amazing dancers or we find attractive without it being as threatening. Yes. Okay, so this is a great example. The, you know, and I, I almost want to ask, what did she do, by the way? Was she aware that you were uncomfortable? Um, yeah. What did she do to help you? Well, I mean, that's, a, I'm glad you're bringing this up because initially we actually didn't have a lot in place. And you could even say that the couple bubble of our relationship wasn't fully intact. Gotcha. And that was creating a lot of that issue. Right. Um, we ended up creating rituals, and I'm I'm reminded of how you talk about the power of ritual in yeah. Wired for Love. Um, but we created rituals before the dance to stare into each other's eyes to say, I am with you. Oh, and fantastic. And even when it looks like I'm, you know, dancing with another person, um, and, and I think this has been valuable for both of us because, you know, she ha has also the capacity to be triggered around me dancing with other people. Yes. Um, so we would create that little ritual and, um, and it was still challenging, at least at first, but, but at least we had that as a reminder of what was paramount, um, that a dance is just a dance, et cetera. Um, so, and then we would check in with each other. I mean, initially we were really conscious of, you know, if we danced with someone else, we would come back to the other person and, right. and, uh, yeah, but it's been, uh, that's been probably one of the ironically most challenging things in our relationship because, and I say ironic because that's how we came together. If we weren't dancers, yes. we wouldn't have even come together in the first place. That's right. So, it, but I, I'm, I have to give you, you know, both uh, kudos here for, handling it quite naturally very well i mean you uh th the idea of beforehand doing a ritual looking into each other's eyes and reaffirming that your primaries um that is uh, a, a very good thing to do very important thing to do um uh because i was going to say a lot of this has to do with the two of you being responsible for the other person's sense of security and safety people don't like to hear that but it's just true so as long as you guys are shoring that up you're paying attention um you're checking with each other uh you're affirming to each other exactly the fears that you both have that are specific to both of you right it's not a general thing but she knows exactly um what you're afraid of you know exactly what she's afraid of and you unequivocally uh, take those things off the table, that's the way you do it. Mm -hmm. That's the way you, exactly what you described. Um, you know, putting an injunction on someone, you're not allowed to do that, is not going to work because it's too unfair. But saying that, you know, this deeply hurts me or deeply f uh, uh, frightens me, uh, then is a, is a back and forth, uh, a lengthy chain of sequence um, where two people work that out so that it's win-win. There is a way to do that always. Yeah, this uh -huh. makes me think about your, one of your, you had 10 principles and you named a bunch of them earlier and one of them was fighting fair, yes. fighting well. Fighting well, yeah. And and then you also talked about fighting smart and and I think you were talking about how to engage your, your smart, vagal uh, response when you're right. actually in a fight. Could you talk about that for a minute or two? Sure. So fighting is really a necessary 
uh, thing. Anger, a necessary emotion. Uh, it's only um, f frightening or threatening to people who come from families where anger or fighting led to disaster and dissolution of a relationship. Therefore, I'm afraid that conflict is going to crash the relationship or uh, the relationship isn't strong enough to handle me. So given that people are okay with this, then it's a matter of uh, we, our, our fighting is both with an eye towards getting relief as soon as possible. Relief meaning that, that we can turn this in such a way as quickly as possible to turn it right side up where both of us feel satisfied. But we have to ha take an interest in this. I have to know what you want. I have to know what you worry about. And I have to give you assurances while I'm fighting for what I want that I have you in mind. Otherwise, you'll fight harder. Um, I have to admit when I'm wrong uh, and relieve you because if your arousal climbs too high, it'll push mine up and now we won't be able to think. Now we're going to be fully primitive and we're just going to act out. So we, we both have a job to do and that is to, uh, to realize that we're on a teeter-totter together. If one of us falls off, we both fall off. So we have a vested interest in paying attention to each other while we fight. We want to make sure that the fighting stays within a certain play area. Um, and if it gets too serious, where one of us is going to start to cry foul, then we fix it quickly. So these are smart things, uh, not just because they, wor they work, but on a neurobiological level, this is the only way it can work um, in order to not accrue bad memories and uh, unfairness and threat. Therefore, anything we get into that's going to be cause a difference in what we want, which is what just about everything, um, means it's another opportunity for us to get what we want and make sure a partner doesn't uh, pay a price um, in some way because that will come back uh, and we'll have to keep dealing with that again and again. That's an effort, right? People yeah. have to care about doing that and see that as the only way of moving forward. Right. Otherwise, otherwise they won't do it. Right, yeah. So like you were saying in the... In my personal example, an injunction that wouldn't have been a win-win situation. Um, it, that, that would, those would be that would be a uh, uh, an area uh, a gauntlet uh, that your partner will. Uh, it'll be hard to resist your partner from uh, uh, either defying that or arguing with that or being resentful. Right. Um, there are a couple things that came to me while you were describing that. One was I thought your very useful. Um, discussion and maybe you could just address this a little bit now of if your partner is an island here is a way to help regulate them um when you're in a breakdown and if your partner is a wave here is a way that you can reach out to help regulate them and because they are strikingly different there yeah. so one thing to understand if your partner is an island know that he or she um, is conflict avoidant by definition. Conflict avoidant uh, 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 is um, uh, trying to stay out of trouble, um, doesn't want to think about bad things, uh, uh, is not giving full answers, yep, nope, uh, is uh, not able to stay in contact for long periods without breaking away because they feel held too long. So their tolerance for staying in physical contact and emotional contact, talking about the relationship is shorter than the average bear because of their early experience. That their need for being alone uh, is not about love, it's about interpersonal stress. They feel too much interpersonal stress and so they distance. Um, their fear of having their self taken is something that you have to help them through because that's a real injury. That's a trauma. It happened of being, you know, used. Um, understanding these things and understanding that they don't, your island doesn't shift well from, uh, from being alone to interacting. They shift well from, uh, uh, you know, in terms of interacting and then being alone. That's an easy shift, but they can't do the other direction very well. So interrupting them um, is like waking them from a sleep. They startle, they get angry. Uh, and they don't track time very well. Having said that, that doesn't mean you let an island rule the roost. Uh, you still get what you want, just understanding that for an island, it's often catch and release. <laughs> it's um, it's uh, being aware of, of how they, they move and what they're afraid of so that uh, you're not activating the, the, their anticipation that you're going to trap them, um, uh, you're going to hold them too long, 
Are you going to force them to do something? Uh, there's all sorts of ways to work with them if you understand the animal that is the island. Yeah, and you, I think you even mentioned that um, that typically words are really helpful because like someone who's an island is in their left brain. So using left brainy kinds of things to reach those people is, did I, was, did I understand you right? Well, because of their, because of their development in the first 18 months of life, they tend to be more left-leaning. Um, they didn't get the same kind of holding interaction, uh, face-to-face, skin-to-skin, eye-to-eye that others did exactly. And so they spend a little too much time alone. So their strategy for self-care is different because of that situation. Um, uh, and so, but that might be misinterpreted as having to do with love. It has to do with safety and security. Right. Got it. Um, and so understanding that um, helps that person not distance as much because I'm anticipating something. And as long as I, I, uh, you, I do something to activate that, it reinforces the memory. Now, it just so happens that you and I pick each other not by accident. You and I pick each other because we recognize each other. We're familiar. That's how we pair bond with familiars. So that what are the chances since I picked you that you're going to do the very same things that activate me uh, from my childhood? Um, about 100%, right? <laughs> so that's a normal, natural thing because we become proxies for everybody who came before us once we get committed. That's, it's a memory system. It's a projective system. Um, therefore, I should now begin to know how to handle the state that I get into and also how to manage you without blaming you. This is a mastery class. This is, you know, how to learn your partner, uh, uh, you know, opportunity. But I have to also understand myself and know my reflexes sometimes are not consistent with secure functioning. If I'm an island, I may get mad at you for interrupting me. I may walk out the door because I can't handle something. I can do all these things that are, uh, that are hurtful um, uh, reflexes, but I then come back immediately and say, I'm sorry, that wasn't right. I shouldn't have done that. I take responsibility for that. Right. So we had talked about the wave understanding the island in conflict and you know, what I was getting is that maybe if, so if you were dealing with an island, you might say something like, hey, you know, I really want to work this out. When would be a good time for us to do that? So you're giving them some, you're, you're mm. not saying I'm going to trap you into the, the working yeah. this thing out or. Actually, just the opposite. The worst thing you can do with an island is to give, uh, is to give them a, a preview um, or to take too long to get to your point. Um, psychobiologically, it's always better to hit something very quickly and then repair and explain after. <laughs> so, um, so it's uh, easier to ask for, uh, for beg for an apology than to ask for permission. Is that? exactly exactly. So if you you know if, if my wife were an island and I wanted more contact, I'd say, uh, come here, look at my eyes, give me a kiss, tell me you love me. Okay, run along. Um, that that's you know uh, funny, but. Basically, I'm going to get what I want, and I'm going to honor and respect um, uh, your tolerance uh, and let you go before you feel like you have to get away. This makes you move forward. Um, I know how to approach you without you uh, feeling threatened. It's, it's, it's a smart way of working, but I'll still get what I want from you. Um, I just have to know how you work um, and, uh, and know that I approach you from this side, not from that side. And how would you approach a wave person then? Very cautiously with, with gloves and maybe a hazmat suit. (laughs) No, I'm kidding. Um, so the wave is more related than the island. They're, they're developed a little bit, um, better. Um, but they talk a lot. They're right leaning. In other words, um, the right hemisphere is dominant for a view of the world that is, um, based on meaning and emotion, right? Mm-hmm. It's the gestalt. It's not precise. Um, uh, there's no precision in the speech of, of a wave. Always, never, right? Um, but there's, a me- there's, there's emphasis on meaning. The left side is, uh, is, a, is a sequencer interested in uh, logic, sequence, um, and, um, uh, uh, you know, a certain kind of reality that is, uh, uh, that is of a narrative kind. So you have two different ways of looking at the world, and these can rub up against each other, certainly, right? Mm. The, w- the wave wants to be close and will cling, but then when he or she gets closeness, will start to complain or push away. 
they're negativistic, which makes them frustrating in a different way. Um, I, you know, I'm allergic to hope, whereas the island is addicted to alone time. I'm allergic to hope as a wave. I want, I keep waiting for something to come to me because that's how I was trained. I don't go and grab it. And so that makes me a very angry person because I'm always aware of what is moving away from me. And if it's moving toward me, it's going to move away again soon. So I push away. I'm, I can be sarcastic. I can be mean. I can be withholding. I can be punishing. Um, because uh, uh, the idea of you being there and then not there infuriates me and scares me. So if you are uh, looking at your uh, phone, um, I will start to get angry. You know, and I'll want you to be with me because you're not with me. That doesn't mean that I'm just, I'm, I'm very good at relationship uh, because I think I am because I had to take care of somebody when I was a kid, but I'm really not that good. I think I am. Just like the island thinks they're really independent, but they're not. Their uh, independence is an adap- adaptation to their neglect. It's not true independence. Um, and so you have to understand that when I'm negativistic, your move is to go toward me, not away from me. In other words, you come close to me. I respond to touch. I respond to physical comfort. I respond to uh, you're approaching me. As an island, I don't like you approaching me. As a wave, I need you to. Got it. Um, I don't shift very well from being uh, with you to being alone, just the opposite of the island. And I don't, I have a hard time with separations and reunions. So I miss you when you're gone. And then, uh, and then when I see you, I'm angry. (laughs) Um, And that's just, it's a reflex. I'm the kind of person as a wave that will wake you up at 10 o'clock and ask you how we are, how we're doing, because that's a separation at night. And as long as you understand who I am, that I need to connect during those times, we're fine. As long as you move toward me when I push away, we're fine, because uh, I expect you to think of me as a pain in the ass and to drop me and to reject me and to punish me. Um, and, uh, and that's my, my fear. And so I act very ambivalently. I talk too much. I overexpress. Um, I, I, I make a lot of sounds. The island doesn't. And so we're talking with a very chirpy, interactive, I need to talk all the time, uh, person. Um, and I need to, uh, I need to feel reassured that I'm not going to be dropped. Um, which I'm very sensitive to. So I I can be hardy. The more that people are engaging with each other with this kind of knowledge of each other, how does that move them towards being more anchor-like? Yes. Yeah, as soon as you and I create a secure functioning relationship, which is an ecosystem, uh, an environment that allows us to be ourselves, we're we're not afraid of anything with uh, with regard to each other, Uh, we're able to tell each other everything, that takes that that releases so many resources that are being used all the time to hold ourselves together in a world that is actually pretty scary. When we do this for each other, now all these resources are freed up to improve oneself, to be creative, to be expansive, to brave the world, because we're tethered together. Um, the relationship does not carry burdens of whether the relationship will exist tomorrow. We, we assure each other it will. Mm. Um, we're each other's ego boosters. We're each other's fans. Um, that does a tremendous thing uh, in terms of allowing people to do more than they ordinarily could if they were alone. It's no small thing. And it does that because? Because the, the fears about relationship dependency are taken off the table on a daily basis and our existential fears are being uh, soothed by the feeling of having uh, being tethered to somebody 24 7 we do that for each other because we can and because as human animals that's what we need so i just want to take this moment to tell our listeners that you do have a chance to win a copy of Wired for Love that uh, Stan Tatkin has generously donated to a lucky listener. You can download the show guide for this episode at neilsatin.com slash wired, and that will enter you for a chance to win this copy of Wired for Love. 
Um, you can also text the word passion to the number 33444 and follow the instructions and that will enter you. So thank you so much, Stan, for, for being oh, willing to you, donate Neil. that. Um, and I, I also just want to point out that this book, it's, it's written, you know, you talked at the very beginning about how important it is to have an owner's manual for your partner and to, and since you, they don't come with one to be a sleuth and to, to figure out what really to know your partner well and what, what is going to make them happy and what's going to trigger them and, um, and to be using, <laughs> using that information for the power of good. Um, and your book, Wired for Love, is a great manual for how to do that. So many valuable exercises um, that will help you get to know your partner, get to know yourself and, and recognize, you know, where, where you're attaching well and, and where some of your insecure attachment styles might come into play. And uh, there are 10 areas. So, um, and there's a chapter for each one. So you'll, you'll come away from the book with a really thorough sense of how to make it work. So, um, thank you also for just writing such a clear book, um, a manual for helping people develop real safety and security in their relationships. Thank you, Neil. Um, uh, it also, if people want audio, there's a, an audio book called Your Brain on Love, and that's just me talking at them. So um, uh, that's another, another good one. But I really loved what you said, what you do with, with Chloe, the dancing, the ritual, how you worked it out with the dancing stuff. That's, uh, that's what I'm talking about, really, in terms of uh, forming a secure functioning relationship, what you guys are doing. Thank you. Yeah, I, I did. I was heartened as I read through because I think – in many respects, our relationship wasn't terribly secure, um, you know, when we got started and, and we suffered a lot for it. And so there are many places in your book where I was like, oh, yeah, that's where that's where we went off the rails a little bit. And and yet we've managed to, to find our way back to that safe place. And, um, you know, your first principle is the couple bubble. And yeah, maybe can you just talk for a, a moment about what is that? Because we've brought it up a few times now. The the couple bubble basically is the idea, the recognition that if, if it's you and I, or let's say you and Chloe, you and Chloe are a primary system, um, uh, and that system has to be protected from outside elements, third elements, um, in order to not uh, have your resources, uh, re, you know, depleted. Um, so the relationship comes first. That's a third thing that you create. It's a phenomenological, never to be repeated, like a fingerprint kind of thing. And the two of you are jealous about uh, the resources that you're able to create. So you, um, basically the relationship comes first. Uh, you are uh, stewards of the sta safety and security system. Uh, if one of you hurts it or threatens the other person's sense of safety, um, it's self-harming. It hurts you too. Uh, so this is a system that's truly mutual, has to be fully collaborative and an adult in the sense that um, it's, it's thinking in the long run, planning uh, creates principles, a social justice system that filters downward and, and across uh, to, to the culture. Um, and they're just good managers of each other, very good managers of each other. I like how you mentioned too that that sometimes people have this, well, I'm, I'll sort of hang out on the outskirts of this relationship while I figure out if this person is, is good for me or not. And, and I want to talk about that momentarily in light of your new book that's just about to come out as, yeah. as the time that we're recording this wired for dating. Um, but, but that the couple bubble creates this sense of I'm all in. And you say that really being all in is the only way that you're really going to be able to sense whether you can be successful in relationship with this person. That's right. Um, a year, I think, is uh, a year or two reasonable um, to vet somebody. But after two years, it becomes unreasonable. Um, you, there's a certain point where you, um, you take each other as you are and stop cherry picking um, <clears throat> as being good enough, right? Um, and you both understand that everyone's uh, a burden. Um, all people are difficult. There's no uh, real such thing as a low maintenance person up close, right? At least not over the long run. And so that understanding as it's as the relationship is is developing is really an important one. But it's hard to do in the first year because you are still auditioning. Um, 
The problem is uh, people together for five years and they're still auditioning, that is a problem. Um, uh, because people act weird when they're auditioning. Mm. So at some point, um, we know this about the human brain, the more options we have, the unhappier we are. We're better with two options at uh, tops, and we choose. And once we choose those shoes, that car, that computer, that partner, um, that's the time we put all our money in on that thing because uh, that is a part of us now. Uh, if I don't put all my money on you, which is an investment in you, then that's a silly thing, right? Because um, now you underperform for me simply because of that. And also, we think freedom comes from staying uncommitted, but it's actually not true. We are most free when we um, are in a commitment and we are loyal to someone or something because that is how we develop our sense of self. We're pouring our energy into that thing to make it the best thing for us as possible. To, 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 to not do that is self-harming, right? Um, if I take you and I don't put all my money on you, you are going to underperform. You won't be that person because you're only as good as I say you are. I'm only as good as you say I am in a two-person system. So it's folly to not do that. Plus, I don't really feel free. It's a weird thing. Yeah, and the reality is that yeah. I think as a partner, you sense if if your partner has exits open, then how would you? What where would it make sense for you to invest all of your time and energy into the exactly. relationship? Yeah, and it de and it defeats the purpose of the relationship, which is to, which is to free resources, not take up more resources. If I'm still unsure about you and I'm still looking around and shopping, that's a lot of resources I'm spending. Uh, I'm preoccupied. When we are in and we just decide to go in together and we start getting to work together, we can do things we can't ordinarily do. First, as a twosome, we become a light to mm -hmm. other people. Secure yeah. functioning couples are very attractive to, to others. Uh, and so this is a, a, you know, a big deal, but we live in a culture of 30-day returns and people are on the fence for a long time. And if we exhumed, you know, all the dead relationships uh, and, and forensically and did a look-see, we'd probably see that most of them that, that didn't work out had at least one person who was not fully in because mm. that creates a threat. Yeah. Yeah. This is hard to get, impart to people. So I want to I want to be conscious of time, um, and I have two like burning questions that I would love to ask you. So do we have okay. a few more minutes? Yeah, and then there's something I I wanted to say also about uh, about the problem of the automatic brain. But yeah, great. So um, why don't, do you want to start there just to make sure that you well that's fresh on your mind? Yeah, let me uh, explain um, how uh, at least in part of how our brains work. We we have. Um, a part of the brain that's novelty seeking, this is very expensive, uh, energy consuming part, high cortical area, very fancy new part of our brain. Um, this is what gets us to go out and uh, get excited about new places, new things, new jobs, new routes uh, to take uh, in our car. Um, it's novelty seeking, but it's energy consuming, um, these high cortical areas. But it's important to know that everything that we experience that's novel is going to be old soon uh, because the brain, in its attempt to conserve energy uh, and to make room for new novelty, has to relegate all new information uh, into automation, and that's called procedural memory. 99% of our day is automatic, right? Um, we drive, we do, we talk. Uh, most of the things we do, we do automatically by memory, and since real time is very, very fast, we never really actually know why we're doing things or what we're doing. That's the way this, this part of the brain works, automatically, fast, cheap. When we meet each other, um, the whole brain is turned on, and there's you know, good and bad about that, but we're in, we're attentive, I want to see you, I want to know you, I want to uh, know everything about you. You are new and shiny and bright, and that is going to end soon because I'm going to automate you soon. <laughs> right? I have to, that's normal. The problem with automation for everybody is that we tend to think we know that person, and we don't. Um, we've relaxed enough, automated them enough to think we know them, and that's dangerous because now we're operating only by memory, not just our memory, but everything preceding us. That's when we make all sorts of mistakes of attribution. 
the enemy um, uh, uh, or the, 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 the enemy of automation or at least the cure or the workaround for automation is what we did in the beginning of the relationship and that is attention and presence. Mm. Only Cur- curiosity. But that creates curiosity. Mm. If I'm looking at you and watching you and still reading you and still paying attention to you and going eye to eye with you, that's novel and that, uh, that keeps me uh, uh, in the present moment as much as possible and now I'm actually here interacting with you. Otherwise, I'm in a haze and I'm seeing a movie. I'm basically uh, doing things automatically, so are you. And we're not even here. So I just wanted to the audience, the way to, to deal with this, the real problem going forward is, is we, we have to bring back um, our interest in attending and being present. Otherwise, our relationships also will, uh, will be in trouble. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I love in your book how you talk about like the power of close proximity and yes. eye contact. And, yes. and you mention attuning specifically, and we've... We had Keith Witt on the show who was talking yeah. about attuning. Um, and then also, um, you know, in the, in the conversation about that novelty seeking and the way that fosters dopamine production in the, yes. in the body, we've, we spoke with um, Diana Richardson, right. um, Heart of Tantra, and Marnia Robinson, Cupid's mm-hmm. Poison Arrow, about how the way that you can engage in intimate behaviors that actually foster oxytocin, which... Yes is about that sustainable pair bonding type of feeling versus the the crash and burn of the of the dopamine fueled right. behavior right so here in, in a, a psychobiological sense we talk about the dopamine or the dopaminergic kind of of excitement as falling into the area of exciting love addictive love and that is necessary to maintain throughout the relationship and that's done through direct eye to eye contact skin to skin and also um, uh, uh, exposing the couple to novelty uh, such as travel and so on um, but that that dopaminergic um, ampli- amplified positive is an important element in, in relationship throughout life but the the quiet love version of that which is serotonergic is uh, is also important. Can we be quiet together without uh, distraction? Can we be in each other's eyes and gaze lovingly um, without that? That's a different state, um, and that's also necessary for couples to be able to co-produce, right? Mm. Um, both of those uh, states, and they're done very differently. Um, uh, love is up close always. Lust is at a distance. Love is up close. That's the way, again, our eyes are, oper- uh, uh, are made. and The brain works with the eyes in such a way. Love up close, lust at a distance. If people remember that, they can evoke uh, feelings of love at any time just by being uh, in each other's eyes gazing. Yeah, love that. Um, and you're reminding me also of the importance of um, being in a conversation about growth in your relationship and how that can bring about novelty as well and variety. Yes. So you... Um, oh, can, I, can I just add one? With, with absolutely, you? yeah. Um, this business about oxytocin, actually oxytocin for women, vasopressin for men, um, these are neuropeptides that actually allow us to stay still without fear. So it's not just simply a bonding chemical. Um, oxytocin uh, allows for stillness without fear, um, such as when breastfeeding or giving birth to a child, um, or when people are having sex. You understand that people are, are penetrating each other, touching each other in areas that they would never stand for, except under this condition, which uh, oxytocin vasopressin allows them to be immobile without fear. Mm. Just so people understand, because there's a lot of misinformation out there about oxytocin. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. I thank you for adding to our understanding of that. I can, and I can see how that would be really important in light of what we're talking about, you know, that that's in a sense, the nature of a secure relationship is that right. you're, you've reached a point with each other. I wouldn't necessarily say it's stillness, but you know, relaxation. Maybe, yeah. Relaxing and, and, um, not experiencing fear. Um, okay, so the burning questions. I've, I have, um, I've heard from several listeners who are actually polyamorous. Yes. And, and I want to bring that into the conversation 
and and to hear how that how does attachment style and you know we've talked a lot about pair bonding um how does that come into play in a successful polyamorous relationship and where can it go awry well this is a, um, a you know it's not a new phenomenon but it's becoming um uh, outed more. Um, uh, the uh, the polys are now coming out because we, we live in a time of uh, more tolerance of, uh, in terms of gender differences and uh, transgender and so on. Uh, so now naturally uh, these other communities are beginning to come forward. The Here's the thing. Uh, we are animals that uh, are herd animals but we tend to pair in the herd. Um, we always tend to pair. So Polyamorous relationships generally start off as a as a twosome, and they expand. They don't start off as a group, generally speaking. So uh, the two becomes a three, becomes a four, becomes a whatever. The now we're getting into something that's very similar in in structure to um, to polygamous cultures, uh, like in Africa and other places where um, the, the 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 marital unit is expanding. Um, and there are many, uh, there are many mothers, <laughs> mm -hmm. um, but there's always still a primary and that primary is the person that when we're in the most distress, we're likely to go to first or when we want to celebrate something that's good news, we want to go to that person first. We don't go to the group. There's always one person and that I just tell people to just keep that in mind because when you start adding more people, you get closer to violating um, certain uh, ideas of safety and security. And somebody begins to start to complain about it, right? Mm. So it's a management issue. As long as people can do this in a secure functioning way, I couldn't care less. I'm interested in people who are not secure functioning, um, that, are, uh, that are sculpting uh, arrangements, relationships that are um, not collaborative, and too unfair, too unjust, and too insensitive. What happens with, between two people is based on their idea of social justice. Otherwise, they come in and see me because someone's unhappy. Right. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah, absolutely. So it's it's about creating a container of safety no matter how many partners or... How many partners. And to keep in mind that uh, that it's sort of in our DNA to to go towards one person uh, more than uh, than another. Right. And and I think you spoke about that right at the beginning, that that just comes from how we have that strong bond, hopefully, with our with our mothers yes. from the very beginning. By the way, there are people who were abandoned early um, who have uh, had a, a severe attachment breaches in childhood who will never uh, rely on another person again. They must have uh, a community. Uh, and uh, and I've seen those people too. They they will never look to a two person system again because it was so devastating to them. So they're going to uh, put more eggs in their basket because that's the safe thing to do. So this is going to be a total divergence now because this is my second <laughs> question. Um, okay. <laughs> Uh, and that is, I wanted to give you a chance to chat about Wired for Dating. Yeah. And um, and originally, you mentioned that when you're dating and when you're in like that kind of newness in, of relationship, all bets are off in some respects in terms of attachment. And yet, we're here to talk about it. So how, do, how does attachment style come into play in a useful way when people are are dating and trying to find the right person to be with? The problem is in the beginning of a relationship, all that stuff is hidden, not just from the other person, but even from uh, oneself, because a lot of these systems aren't activated until there's, an, uh, uh, until there's the perception of permanence. Um, they, re they remain dormant. So when we're in courtship, um, um, we're basically in a blank slate situation where we can be anything we want to be, and that's what we're enjoying. We're basking in the glow of each other's mutual positive projections because we really don't know each other, but we've recognized each other somehow because, again, that, that idea of the brain loves simplicity when it comes to pair bonding. So I'm picking somebody that I recognize that's familiar to me to some degree, but maybe not the kind of person I'm going to stay with uh, because they have to be really 
uh, familiar in order for me to continue with them. But maybe they're good for a one-night stand or just a romp, right? Um, nature has put me on a cocktail of drugs that, um, that make judgment difficult for me because mm-hmm. um, nature just wants me to procreate. So that's great. Um, we're just going to have sex um, or flirt or whatever it is. Um, and the problem with this is that nature doesn't care about long-term relationships. So my first pick when I see you during in, the infatuation phase is I'm also blinded in certain ways. Um, I'm blinded by, uh, by the, the way my brain is, uh, is uh, operating because of all these neurochemicals, but also the novelty, all of that excitement. It's really fun. And it's also stressful, by the way, because what's supposed to happen is that if I meet uh, my partner or I meet somebody at a, at a party, um, what's to keep me from forgetting them? Well, there's a drop in serotonin, and I, uh, and I start to perseverate, start to obsess. I get anxious about when am I going to see you again, when am I going to call you again. That's nature's way of keeping us tethered enough to continue the courtship process. Um, but... If I'm really trying to look at you as somebody who's a viable partner, I cannot leave it up to myself alone to do that. I must, we must use our social network to vet each other. That's not just our parents, but our friends of all ages, male and female, must um, uh, see us uh, together, comment on us privately to us. Um, They're watching out for whether we look good together, interact well together, whether we fit into the social structure well together. It's not about hormones. It's not about <laughs> lust. It's about um, does this person fit and do they enhance you? So people who do not vet their partners are in, at more risk uh, than anybody else at, at having a problem later on. Um, uh, that's what we have our friends for is to uh, is to um, give us feedback because we're uh, when we're in this lustful infatuated phase we're we're not thinking straight <laughs> we're just not um, and uh, and so that's a big part of of our sense of of whether you know this person fits into our life as whether they fit into our friendship culture or family culture those who don't they're going to have some trouble yeah. Well, that's a great um, sneak peek into your book, and I was privileged enough to receive an advanced copy and and flip through it, and I can tell everyone who's single and wondering, well, all this talk about relatedness sounds great, but how am I going to apply this to to um, my singledom? Um, this book, which will be out in January, is going to be a real treat for you to uh, to help you explore how to know again know yourself, and then see how that's going to impact you as you're interacting with other people. Well, um, Stan Tatkin, thank you so much for being here on the show today. You've been so generous with your time and your knowledge and uh, your humor and (laughs) uh, really appreciate your being here. If people want to find out more about you, they can, of course, visit um, the the show notes page for this episode, which is neilsatin.com slash wired. But um, Stan, what would be a good way for people to find out about what you're doing? Uh, they can go to stantatkin.com, and from there they can also find a link to the PACT Institute. Uh, uh, we train a uh, couple therapists in uh, this psychobiological approach all over the world. But you can also get my readings and other things uh, on stantatkin.com, and on Twitter I'm Dr. Stan Tatkin. Great, and you also do workshops for couples as well, yes. right? Yeah, my wife and, and I do uh, retreats. Uh, we do them at Esalen. We do them uh, at uh, Kripalu back east. Uh, um, and we're going to be doing one in Costa Rica in May. So people are welcome to come. Uh, we're going to be in another place, and I've forgotten the name of the place back east. Kripalu and Omega will be there next year. Great. Well, um, so many opportunities to get to know you and your work, and, um, and I appreciate your taking the time to be with us on the show today to get to know you as well. So thanks so much, Stan. Thank you, Neil. You've been great. Thank you for listening to another episode of Relationship Alive. If you like what you've heard and want to make it easier for other people to find out about us, please take a moment to subscribe to our podcast and to rate and review us on iTunes. If you have questions or comments or want to continue the conversation, you can always join our Relationship Alive community Facebook group. 
And for more information about today's episode, visit us online at neilsatin.com slash podcast. Or you can always text the word passion, P-A-S-S-I-O-N, to the number 33444 for more information. Finally, do you have a burning question that you're hoping we can have answered here on Relationship Alive, either for a future or past guest? Let me know and I'll see what I can do. Take care and see you next time.